Welcome to Vinted with Scout Driscoll. Come along with me on my journey into the wine world, where I share thoughtful conversations with wine industry leaders. Get ready for marketing insights from branding and design to sales and social media. And the answer to the ultimate question, what moves wine? Hi everyone, I'm Scout Driscoll, founder of Vint Studio and host of Vinted, where I ask top leaders in the wine industry, how do you move wine? Past episodes include conversations on brand strategy with Amanda Wurzbach, our dedicated brand strategist, and design thinking with Faith Hurley and Stacey Calligan of Pinpoint Collective. Today's guest is Nicole Walsh. She has a 26-year veteran wine label designer and currently at the Delicato family of wines. I cannot wait for you to meet her. But before we get to our conversation, here's a quick message from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Vint Wine Branding and Design, where rich storytelling meets smart design. At Vint, our studio goes beyond the label guiding wine brands through strategy-rich branding and packaging evolutions. Our work with Cooper's Hawk has helped them grow their nation's largest wine club to over 450,000 members. You can always learn more about Vint at vint.studio. And for a free label audit for your brand, just email me at hello at vint.studio. So today, I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Nicole Walsh. Nicole's a 26-year veteran designer and creative leader in Napa Valley. There, she's lent her amazing talents to wineries such as Gallo and Jackson Family and currently serves as a creative manager of Delicato Family Wines and the Family Coppola. I've long been impressed with Nicole's vast and varied experience in the wine industry, and it's an honor to have her on the show today. Welcome, Nicole. I'm so glad to have you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I, so you and I connected when I started meeting more folks in Napa Valley, and you've just been so gracious to connect me with um, so many people who are the really, like, I can't tell you how nice the people in your circle are. And I'm so grateful to be part of that. I, um, you know, when I was starting Vint so often, I was just incredibly intimidated to bring our studio to the West Coast thinking, well, it's the wine industry, you know, it's a very old industry and there's a lot of ego and, and it's just been so amazing to meet all of these collaborators and to meet people who are just so welcome and, and honest and natural in terms of their way of speaking and how they connect and how they collaborate. Um, for you, I've always been so blown away by your natural leadership style and ability to connect people, uh, especially in an industry that can be saturated with ego. It's nice to know a fellow designer who's so open to discussing the creative process. So thank you so much for that. I'm so grateful um, that we're going to give people some insights onto, into how to design really great wine labels today. So thank you. I'd love to you know, talk a little bit more about how your path has taken you here and like how you ended up in such an amazing leadership role at Delicato. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. I began my career a while ago, about 26 years, as you mentioned, um, just starting at HPA Design in San Francisco. And we designed various labels. Uh, Being an agency, you work for multiple clients. So that was a wonderful way to start my experience as a designer in wine labels, uh, focusing on wine labels and uh, wine-related packaging. So starting there, um, just learning all the the nuance of wine label design and every component of the package that you'll take into consideration, the capsule, the cork, the adornment on the top of the capsule. Is there a capsule? Um, Do you have um, maybe a gossamer piece of fabric tied around the neck of the bottle? You know, it's, it's anything you want and it's, it has to be true to the style of the wine so in a perfect world, when you're beginning your package design, you, you want to learn as much as you can about the winemaker, the winery, the family, the story, the history that will absolutely drive and inspire your design. Absolutely. And I, I think it's been so nice to see you know, your team's work at Coppola and now at Delicato Family Wines, how there's so much concept that goes into the pieces that you, that you have. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, design trends later. But you know, one of the things that I'm most excited to, to speak with you about is that, I mean, after 26 years of designing for wine, and I know your mm-hmm. work goes beyond packaging, it's point of sale, it's advertising, et cetera. But um, in terms of wine label design and for wine packaging, whether that's you know, a wrap, et cetera, um, what are your must-haves for a great label? And we could talk about this for an hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel like You and I could just riff on this yeah. nonstop. But right. um, you know, what are, when, when you review one of someone on your team's concepts or when you think about you know, the very beginning of a wine label project, what are your must have? So walk us through your creative process and and really the boxes that you look to check. Sure. Well, first of all, it obviously has to have impact on shelf because nothing will move if it doesn't rise above the competition in a saturated market. 
in the store. So as a designer, you think of that first, what's going to let that uh, logo and identity not be recessive on shelves. If it's going to be in a market situation, if it's a DTC, you know, direct to consumer tasting room only, that's a different consideration. So you have a bit more freedom there. But if you're if you're designing with first intent to be shelf impact in the store, then that has to be considered. So logo has to be, you know, hierarchy of elements, of course, right? Lower key, um, the logo hierarchy being, of course, primary. And then secondarily, maybe the uh, probably the varietal. Vintage could be tertiary. Um, the appellation could be tertiary. It depends. Or secondary. It depends. So it really it has so much to do with the wine itself. If it's a Napa Valley Cabernet, that's known world, world, you know, across the world, the, the Napa Valley at being one of the top regions for Cabernet. So you m- might not make that as recessive as you would um, another varietal. So, so yeah. California that- red wine. <laughs> Right, exactly right. California red blend, yeah. you know, different. Um, if you have a Napa Valley Cabernet you're working on, then you really want to highlight that. But of course, the logo and the identity being primary focus. And then, of course, you know, who is it for? Is it um, female or male skewed? That's important. And uh, the marketing team is always wonderful at defining that, who our demographic is in our target market. So that's um, defined by the marketing team. And then the designer will take that in um, absolutely top of mind when beginning the design. Is this, yeah. uh, you know, designed for a 25-year-old female or is it designed for a 65-year-old male? Who Who is the consumer here? So as a designer, it's very important to consider that, of course, but, you know, still be creative in your ideas and your um, process. Be true to yourself, you know. Totally. So two episodes ago, I, I met with uh, Faith Hurley and Stacey Callaghan from Pinpoint Collective, and I'm obsessed with them. Like, if you don't know them, you should, everyone listening. Um, but what I love about their business is Pinpoint Collective is a design thinking studio. So they are, they're not designers, they're, they're design thinkers. So they work with clients on strategies that are all about the end user and like walking around the end user shoe. So when you talk about target audiences and who is this label for, take a look at the episode we recorded with Faith and Stacey. And we'll talk a lot about how you can use design thinking to really walk around their shoes and understand exactly what it is that is going to endear your brand to your consumer you know, and all those little levers and, and how to think about walking around in their shoes. So I, I definitely recommend checking that out. I love you know, that. You know, you were saying that like, really, you have to think about shelf presence. And I just, I, I feel like a broken record on this, but shelf presence means such a different thing today, you know, with the advent of DPC and sales going up so high for online sales during COVID with the, you know, kind of, it was almost a like bifurcation between like grocery brands really doing well in store. And focus, you know, people didn't want to talk to sales people. Like they were terrified to literally have a conversation with a salesperson. So it was those familiar brands that did well in store, but everyone else had to really focus on online sales and direct consumer uh, because tasting rooms weren't around, et cetera. So I think, you know, the digital shelf presence is, is very different. You know, now people aren't necessarily seeing your label side to side with a thousand other labels, but they're looking at it on Drizzly when it's a centimeter tall, or they're seeing right. it posing with it on Instagram Good or- point. Yep. Okay, your feed. So it's, it's so interesting in terms of not only knowing your demographic, but knowing where you're selling your wine, primarily, Absolutely. and like how that affects that. Definitely. Very good point. And that's, it, that's always, you know, part of the project brief, if you will, that comes to the designer that um, the work has been done on the back end by the marketing team and um, the sales teams to determine where it will be. And then that's conveyed to the, con- the designer. And then you absolutely take that front of mind in uh, how you're going to approach this package. Um, and then, you know, basically in a perfect world, you have some nice content and a nice story yeah. that lives with the winery, the winemaking family, the sense of place, the region. And in a perfect world, you have some really nice content that can inspire your design. Um, you know, for example, if it's a region from Napa Valley and, you know, hummingbirds are found there, then yeah. it, if that's a native species to the appellation that that grape comes from, then you might consider folding in a hummingbird element, just for example, and then have the story of the relationship of the hummingbird to that sense of place, or, you know, whatever that story is, uh, try to get as much true, authentic content as you can before you begin your design and really try to avoid just making a pretty label because that's kind of the beginning 
Um, when you begin your career as a designer, it's very easy to just make things really pretty and make a beautiful piece of art. And that's lovely and nothing's against that. But if you can really elevate your work to have the elements on that label be meaningful, deliberate, authentic, yes. then that takes it to the next level. Yes. You know, and, and not to keep rolling back to previous episodes, but I just, okay, I'm asking the smartest people in the world that I know to be on this podcast. So I like, it's just so funny how much it all circles back. But when I spoke to Amanda Wurzbach, our brand strategist, she was saying, you know, people don't buy wine. They buy the idea. They buy that brand story. They buy that experience. Absolutely. And it's so true, you know, and I, as much as smaller producers kind of line up into the, and I'm going to use the word tropes very lightly here, but into the tropes of it's about my vineyard and the soil, or it's about my AVA, or it's about my grandfather's name and what he did. You know, but there are, there are certain themes and often reused themes in winery marketing. But even if it's bulk wine, you know, and or even if it's a wine that's a grocery brand, you can create you know, a mystifying story around a brand that might not necessarily tie into just one varietal or one vineyard. You know, I'm thinking of Archer Roos, who, you know, Mariana Archer Roos has developed this beautiful. Um, series of canned wines. They're sourcing wine from all over the globe. They're allowing people to take that journey through, you know, a Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, or they're enjoying a, you know, a Grecian orange wine. Um, but it's all under the the concept of wanderlust and about this woman Archer Roos, who was able to travel the world as a socialite and and discover wine and connect with, you know, wine making techniques back in like the 1800s, I think. So you can create a brand story that is divorced of the specific grape or varietal or terroir or history. Um, it just has to be consistent and emotional and have that, yes. that connection. And, you know, I mean, look at 19 crimes. It's about the Australian criminal diaspora. Like that has nothing to do with the grape. It's one right. of the selling wines in the world. So, you know, understanding your story is so critical and conveying that in the blink of an eye. And I think that's what's so exciting about speaking with you is like everyone reads design. People are born reading design. Babies read design. Designers yeah. speak it. You know, definitely. I, yeah, I love that shared understanding that designers have, you know, and back to your original point about Napa Valley and the wonderful community here. I couldn't agree more that I, I love the network of friends and professionals that, that we all have here because we have such a passion for this industry. We have such a passion for what we do. Everyone that I've met, you know, at Delicato joining the new team has been amazing. And then coming from Coppola, we're all so passionate. We're there's so many industries you can work in, right? As a designer, you can design for anyone, but I personally will will be very reluctant to ever design anywhere that's not wine because I love it so much. Yeah. And, and I put my heart and soul into the designs that I make because I understand it. And um, I've built those relationships and just have that fundamental kind of respect for the industry and the process, you know, well, from- yeah, from the is. moment sorry, from the moment the grapes are picked through harvest, like we just finished harvest, and you know we're all connected during this time. Like when the rain came, this is good for the grapes, and you know every every everything that we think of and consider is related to the winemaking process. And then we get the great honor of packaging that amazing wine for consumers to enjoy. So it's it's a wonderful industry. I couldn't love it more. <laughs> yeah. And I think with the colleagues that you share in the design community, especially in Napa, you know, at the end of the day, you're all selling the same product. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, United and Southwest Airlines are both getting you from point A to point B is something my colleague Amanda says all the time, but what they're selling is the brand and the experience. And, and at the end of the day, everyone's selling Napa Valley wine, <laughs> but they're selling it in such a unique way that it's not even competition. It is about the idea of uplifting the entire ABA, about building a narrative for the quality of Napa wine. And, and that, that, that type of collaborative attitude and looking at like the Vintners Association and how people collaborate is just so inspiring. I love that. Yeah, it is great. And then there definitely are nuances, you know, of uh, different uh, varietals throughout the Valley. So it's wonderful to explore, you know, one Napa Valley cap from one winemaker may be vastly different from another Napa Valley cap. So, it, you know, it kind of encourages you not to limit yourself when you go and visit any, any wine region, like explore and really, um, to, you know, try to discover the differences between the, the varietals. Absolutely. So are there any other, you know, must haves beyond like rich storytelling, obviously the hierarchy for labels. Um, how do you feel about, you know, kind of the general convention in wine label design? And this is something I, I struggle with. We're, we're a contemporary design studio. You know, we don't necessarily design a lot of very, uh, 
traditionally authentic wine label designs. And I think there's a lot of, you know, genre adherence in design aesthetic for different places. You know, if you pick up a wine from Alsace, it's going to look like a wine from Alsace. And a lot of times those wines have rules and, and especially European and old world wines have uh, AVAs have different rules for what their packaging can look like. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for the history and tradition of wine label design, but there are also conventions that I love to break. And I feel like at Coppola, especially you've done such a great job of leaning into um, Francis's story and like the, the, the film narrative, et cetera, like that you have really been able to play and, and present wines that feel quite different than a lot of what's happening in uh, the Valley in general. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, your, your inspiration also like how you feel about breaking out of those stereotypes in wine label design. Yeah, we, yeah, we've been very fortunate working so closely with Francis. Um, I've been there the past four years and then, um, now with Delicato that began in August, um, which has been great too, but working so closely with Francis, we, it has been great. The zoetrope is such a impactful element, you know, in, in his thinking. So that's what inspired the director's cut line. So that's the label that goes up the bottle and that's inspired from the zoetrope itself, which was, um, it's a drum with, uh, images on the inside that would, when you spin, it made a moving picture. So that's what inspired that whole line of wine. And that came directly from Francis. So having uh, that type of really, truly authentic to his childhood and his experience growing up as inspiration for the label is a blessing, you know, very, it's pretty rare that you get something so unique and so authentic and ownable like that. Um, and that came straight from him. So, you know, not to him on that. And um, yeah, basically just, Every, you know, and it's same with the diamond line, the diamond series too, that, um, you know, the, uh, the claret, the iconic claret, the black and gold with the gold um, wire mesh, you know, that's another inspired by Francis concept. So it, it, nothing exists on the label that isn't meaningful yeah. or has a reason. So that, that would be my advice to designers too. When designing, don't add superfluous details just to add them and try to avoid adding a decorative element. You can add some certainly, but try to avoid adding extra elements that are just taking up space or don't have a purpose or a reason. So if you can keep your designs as real and meaningful as possible while being impactful, and of course, given the, the mood and the that emotion that you talked about, Scout, I love that you said that because that's so much a part of it. Keeping that folded into your design um, will render a beautiful result. Yeah. We always say, you know, it's like, it's like when you dress for the day and they say, you know, put on everything and then take off one thing. Exactly. I was actually going to quote Coco Chanel because I thought of that, you know, take a look in the mirror and then take three things, you know, like it's or the earrings, it's not both. Like think Coco Chanel is what Right, Coco before Chanel, that wonderful film. Yeah. Um, I do very often think that. Uh, yeah, take be careful not to over embellish. Be um, thoughtful and and deliberate in the way you embellish and decorate yeah. your package. Because it's, you're you are communicating, you're speaking design, and people are going to read that. And and even if someone doesn't know what as I think you call it the claret, the the metal mesh on yeah. the Coppola bottle, which is so iconic. Um, mm-hmm. If they don't know what it is it's still, there's still a feeling that they get from that. And like, yeah. really, I, you know, I really think knowing the feelings that you're trying to evoke going into the project, it's just mission critical because otherwise you're just yeah. looking cool or you're, you're stealing or carrying forward these traditions or tropes from other wineries. And not to say like, don't understand your competitive set, not to say like, try to always look completely different than what's happening. Cause I think you have to, you know, compete, but not emulate when it comes to any design, whether you're designing, you know, a logo for a, we're designing a logo for a promotional product company right now. You know, like there's, you have to compete and just to, to know where you are in the context of that design, but, but you also have to know what makes you unique and different. And so often that's how you make people feel and how a product makes you feel. You know, when I see that, that wrap on a Coppola bottle, A, it's incredibly distinctive. No one else is taking the time to do that. I don't know how you even do that in production. Like there's right. so much hand labor, but it is such a differentiator that it makes it worth it in the end. And I think you know, that's, I guess that's more advice I would give, especially to winery owners is to look at the, you know, the, the investment for things that maybe need to be hand applied or things that may be more caustic, you know, they affect your cogs, right? Like everyone's like, oh my God, my cogs. 
And, and like, there might be an embellishment to a label, or there might be a necker or something that hangs off the bottle that is adding to your overall price point. You have to think about the money you're leaving on the table when your product isn't differentiated and whether or not that is the thing that's going to get the bottle in someone's hand and then in their cart, because they want to feel it. They want to know what it is. They want to see it, understand it, read the back to understand why it looks like that. Um, So it's so often clients are just thinking, how can we get the printing as cheap as possible? But you have to think about what you're leaving, the money that you're leaving on the table. So I I love that you guys in the past have been so open to going the extra mile. Um, yeah, when when you can do, oh my gosh. And it's all about to the tier, right? The price yeah. point. There's always, uh, as a designer, that's always the, one of the first questions I ask is, are there going to be multiple tiers of this wine? You know, is this a starter tier? Is there going to be a reserve tier? Is there going to be a highly allocated tier? And if so, that's very helpful for the designer to know on the front end, because you want to reserve those bells and whistles, right? For that higher price point bottle, so that that can really be the piece de la you know, elegance yeah. that, 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 rent, that makes sense for that, that extra spend. But then how do you have that consistent look across the family of wines from the base tier to the mid tier to the higher tier. So that's important to consider. Um, yeah. The more information for the designer on the front end, the better it, to, to the best of the ability of planning departments. I know it's sometimes it's hard later. Yeah. They, you know, reserve may pop up that wasn't planned originally. And that's fine too. Designer can certainly pivot and elevate, but uh, as, as when you're designing, do consider the price point for sure. If you can look more expensive, then the price point, that's a win. Yeah. If you can add things that make it have a perceived higher value than its actual shelf price point, that's exceptional. Yeah. Then it's because it doesn't want that, you know? Yeah. And of course there's restrictions with production. Like we're, we're, we're realists, you know, when we do a label for Cooper's Hawk, they've got 450,000 people in their wine club. We are running that labeling line so fast. <laughs> like, you know, there, and when you work with larger producers, you know, top 50 wineries, like the, the production is so high and so quick and, and gets shipped all over the country. So there, there are things that you need to consider, of course, as a designer in terms of the reality of how your product will, will be literally how your label will be literally applied, how things will shift yes. or get dog-eared or banged up too much. So, um, you know, we, we know we live in reality, but it, there, there comes a certain point where that, that one little kiss of an extra detail will allow you to stand out from the crowd. And that's where it's worth doing some analysis and doing that design thinking, thinking about it from your consumer's perspective and deciding whether or not that is something that will truly make the decision-making process a little bit easier at the end line. Definitely. Yep. I mean, do you definitely fold in as, as much elegance as you can, depending on the price, the wine, or, or, you know, maybe like to your point there, I mean, there's so many different styles in wine labels. So not Everything needs to look the same and walk the same walk. It, they serve different purposes. You know, there may be a lower price point wine that's intended to drink all throughout the week, and it's yeah. not necessarily intended for anniversaries or birthdays. You know, so the design it's the designer's job to differentiate that in the way you even approach the design. And then to your earlier point, I love what you said about you know looking at competitive set. You you can be in, you can certainly be inspired by something and not have it be you know. A, a copy or knockoff, but certainly it's wonderful to, as a designer to always, like I always go to what I call my art gallery, which is the wine section of any store. Yeah. Um, and I just, I'm not even there to buy anything. I'm just looking yeah. at what is out there, where my eye goes, where my eye doesn't go. What is something I would buy? What is something I would never buy and why? And then I ask male friends of mine and female friends of mine, what is the first one you would pick here and why? And then, you know, that kind of information is wonderful for any beginning designers. It's a great thing to do. If you're starting in the wine label industry, just uh, take a look at the shelves and see what's out there and what recedes and what stands out. And then it helps educate you when you go to do your design work. Yeah. You've seen, the, you know, whether it's maybe there's high, high build added to something, mm-hmm. which is that very shiny, it looks like clear nail polish, almost mm-hmm. high build technique added to certain elements on a label really shimmers on shelf. And it's a subtlety that most consumers wouldn't necessarily be able to identify, but designers bought it and said, oh, wow, that did make my eye go to that label. Or yeah. the fact that that's a you know cartouche or the fact that that's a foil embossed medallion, you know, whatever it is that's on that label, um, take that into consideration. Yeah. And again, that's part of speaking design. Like you and I know the conventions in design that live within a competitive set that convey quality 
that convey age, that convey, <laughs> you know, all, all of those different things. And I think what's so fascinating for me as a designer coming into the wine industry, you know, and again, we've worked with Cooper Talk for eight years. We've done over a hundred wine labels for them and other clients. So I'm not, not a wine label designer, but we also come from my, my studio I started in 2003, which is Design Scout, which is pan industry. We work with a lot of like very Instagrammable restaurants and we work with a lot of consumer goods and products outside of the wine world. And I think what's so fascinating to me in some ways is the newcomers to the wine industry, like the Archer Ruses, who are focusing on you know canned wine with really bold, colorful labels. They're not trying to look expensive or aged or you know yep. allocation in any way. They're trying to say, this is for a younger audience. Yeah. And when you watch the wine industry as a whole, scrambling a little bit to identify with and connect with those younger audiences and bring those experiences that they're so interested in, um, it's just so fascinating to me to, to see how designers can use other tools in their toolbox to connect with younger, demog- younger demographics, um, you know, and, and present packaging that breaks the rules. You know, that's, that's so fascinating. I love that. Definitely. I love that. And I love the wine in the can, obviously Sophia 2004, you know, yeah, it, yeah. they're so portable and, and easy and, and just great. And um, I, I it, absolutely that the winemaker should consider that in the winery, what vessel, even what mm-hmm. style, what approach, would that wine be distributed it, for that market who's buying it? Yeah, for the demographic. And Absolutely. so many of my favorite movers and shakers in wine are really focused on the democratization of wine, you know, the accessibility of wine. You know, when I think of the Cooper's Hawk story, Cooper's Hawk is, you know, they're at the end of the day, they're to a certain extent a suburban restaurant, right? They're at like a middle flyover state kind of suburban restaurant, but they're the 30th largest winery in the country. You know, they produce wine and they bring wine. Not only do they have like 60 everyday labels, but through their wine club, they bring the experience and the uh, approachability of wine. They make it so accessible for people that never have thought they'd have a monthly wine club. You know, and through that, we help them travel the world, much like Archer Roos. We talk about, you know, here's here's a Gruner Butliner, here is a Chenin Blanc from South Africa. We're going to introduce <laughs> you to the, the best producer of Riesling in the world. So I, I just, that's the people in the wine industry that are focused on making wine accessible to everyone that really get me excited. And I think there's such, there's such a sea change happening where the, the visuals of wine is changing to kind of follow that. And I think you're going to see that slowly creep up into the grocery shelves where, you know, the DTC and the young gunslingers and all of these independent producers are, are getting pretty edgy, but I, I want to see beyond Orange Swift. I want to see more of that happening at retail. And I think yeah. that's the consumers get younger and younger. Well, of course, 21, but right, right. <laughs> younger, you know, generations age into the wine world and get off of seltzers. You know, they're going to want those cans of wine. They're going to want that convenience and playfulness and sense of rebellion. So it's just so fun. Definitely. I love that. I love what you say. And I t- couldn't agree more with that. The whole, of, the style of a designer, you have to be agile. You have to be open to change. You have to be able to pivot and it, it, I, I found most designers that I know and have worked with, we are kind of naturally pro-change, agile, nimble, able to pivot if if a direction changes or or the market changes. The market tells us, so, you know, it, yeah. it may not be what you personally, you, Nicole, sees the label being. If the market's telling you something else, you have to respond to that. You have to consider that respond, pivot. And now still bring your design skills, you know, bring those same tools Mm -hmm. that you've always used, but consider how the market has changed and it changes every single day. So um, we're very, very much on the pulse of that. So I I love that you mentioned that because if you have one design style that may have worked for a number of years, rethink that. Don't, Don't ever mind hitting reset and refresh a bit to respond to uh, changing market trends, not necessarily trends, it's the wrong word, but st- um, tendencies, let's say, you know, styles. Well, and I think a lot of wineries are starting that, you know, B tier, C tier, you know, wines where they want to, maybe they have a higher price point wine and they want to have the more accessible level of wine to younger audiences who are trialing more affordable wine. And that's where they can begin to like unbutton their top button, <laughs> you know, like get a right. little more exactly. relaxed in their packaging and their design. Um, you know, and for example, we were just uh, a little side note, we were working on a spirit label right now and it is, um, it's the kind of product that we, it's going to take some adoption. Like there's, it's, it's a little bit out of, or out of the ordinary for a spirit. And we worked with the pinpoint collective team to get some data 
on our target audience. And speaking of like, it might not be Nicole's comfort level, like everyone on the project is Gen X. And we were like, this is a perfect product for Gen X. And then we hired our team to do some design thinking, you know, quantitative and qualitative research. And they were like, hey, dudes, this is actually a millennial brand. Gen X will only enjoy it after the millennials adopt it. And the early adopters are this age group and these people. And we had to completely take off my, you know, take off our Gen X thinking hat and put on our millennial thinking hat and, and learn how to, to connect with people in that world without following trends and stereotypes. Like that's, that's what's just so fun about this whole process. You know, I think for sure, you know, one of my label must haves too, is like, try not to be trendy, try to keep it rooted in your story and your authentic story. I think there's so many, uh, so many younger designers just like to go on Pinterest and, and grab whatever is unique. Like if, if I can find your wine label design pretty similarly on Pinterest or dye line or packaging of the world, like you're, you're not being true to your client's vision and the story behind that. So always try to be more clever than the trend because that, that label might be around for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So you want to make sure that you're staying evergreen by staying rooted in that strategy and not just what's hip right now, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And clients love sending inspiration. <laughs> They're like, Ooh, but I love this font. I'm like that font. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Canva, but like Canva is the online design tool. And one of our rules is like, if, if we can find that in Canva right now, mm-hmm. That is going to be hot years. for two right. weeks. <laughs> right. and that's what that's what's great for Canva. It's super fresh, hip, easy, to accessible. You know, but but you know, really, just not following trends is so important. Um, Definitely, so, yeah. You can certainly be inspired by what's new, um, but but don't let the trend steer you um, in a direction that isn't authentic. Is would be my advice. Yeah. Are you stealing? Are you steering the trend, or is the trend steering you? And I think that's right. Exactly. That's, so, that's the biggest challenge to the designer, right? To to create the next trend, you know, there was there was a time in my life where I had done a late, I done logo for a restaurant here in Chicago, and um, maybe five years later, every restaurant that's opening in Chicago had like antlers in it, and they're all like <laughs> antler inspired like ornaments. And I was like, I am an old English text, and I was like, I am so over this trend. And then I thought back, and I was like, oh, oh, that's what we did for Rocket Bar and Grill, and I was like, I started okay. that trend. <laughs> So, you're like, oh, like, I actually did that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, be, be, being, you know, steer the trend, don't follow the trend. Um, okay, one thing I'm really excited to talk to you about, because I think truly you're probably one of the only designers in the world who I could have this conversation with, um, is you, my team and your teams are two of the only designers who've gotten to design wine specifically for award ceremonies. Um, yes. And that's so fun. So uh, we've done the Screen Actors Guild Awards wine. Uh, I think it's around our fourth or fifth year now. And then you did some wine with Coppola for an award ceremony too. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I have it here. It's the uh, the 93rd Awards, the gold bottle, um, designed specifically for, uh, this is for Francis in his vision. There's the, um, this is the Chardonnay. This is the Russian River Valley Chard and the Alexander Valley Cap. And these were for the Academy Awards, uh, the Governor's Ball, actually. And um, what's lovely about that is, this was authentically the vision of Francis it, to align with his Oscar. Yeah. So his, his idea was he wanted people to hold the bottle and do a pretend speech. I love <laughs> like, it. Hey, it's been amazing. And, oh, and that's that, that was his, right, that was his idea it came directly from him. And we were able to implement, and not myself alone, my gosh, no, our product development team was exceptional as well in yeah. making this become a reality. And of course, the vendors who worked on it. So a uh, team collaborative effort for sure. But um, I think we're all very proud of that in that we achieved the vision that Francis had in mind. And it was derived from the authentic experience of the, the Oscar that lives there at the winery in, in Geyserville at Francis Ford Coppola Winery. And you can go upstairs and see them. That he keeps them in the case there. So th- that's what's lovely about that is it wasn't let's just make a gold bottle because gold is cool. It was yeah. it, directly very deliberately is representative of his Oscar. So yes. And so for those of you listening, not watching at home, uh, it is a mirrored gold wine bottle. There are two of them and they are gorgeous. There's a full metal like nameplate. Uh, so it's got hardware kind of like that when you engrave someone's name on an Oscar um, and it just is unbelievably stunning and talk about differentiation on screen. You know, I'm not sure how televised the governor's ball is, but um, you know, when we were working with the Screen Actors Guild and Cooper's Hawk to develop the red wine for those shows, um, we ha- it's just so interesting, especially because we've done the same wine four or five years in a row. Yeah, every year it has to be fresh and different, right? It can't just be the same design every year, but it also has like such limited, you know, 
rules for that. It has to have a Screen Actors Guild logo on it. It has to have a Cooper Talk logo on it. It has to have a statuette on it. It has to, you know, it, but it can't have the year because it's not a vintage. Okay. <laughs> so, like, so, but it's just been so fascinating to like play with the idea of like, not only does this, does this label look great on camera, is it noticeable on camera when it's on the table? Also, they don't tell you this, but no one actually drinks at award ceremonies. Shh, I don't know if I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, because they don't want to get red teeth. Really right. kind of like be caught enjoying a beverage on camera. So it's really, but it, it's amazing to see like how, how that one bottle, even though it's so tiny, you know, tiny on this huge ornate table, of course, this is kind of pre COVID as well. Uh, but thinking about how that bottle reads on camera and in all the Getty images that come out the next day. And, and then also have to have shelf presence because their screen actor skill wines are sold in stores and to the wine club. So it is such a, you know, one of the most Herculean efforts to, almost think of, you know, casting your bottle on air <laughs> and also on the shelf and also at the table, the restaurant, et cetera. So it's just such a fun project to think of how to scratch all those itches in one four by six inch of sticky paper. <laughs> right, exactly. And then in your case with all those, you know, elements that had to be included, like how to yeah. keep it from becoming cluttered. Right. And that's where you're so highly skilled at balancing the nuance of design and a highly skilled designer like you can, do that successfully because it is challenging when you have a lot of things that need to be on there, but yeah. you, you know, you back that Coco Chanel thing, you can't have earrings with the necklace with the bracelet with, you know, it's like, it's gotta be, there's still the hierarchy has to remain intact, right? There's to be one first thing that the consumer eye goes to. And then the secondary and tertiary elements after that. And you're so good at doing that as well. So it's, it's even more challenging when you have many components that you need to include. Yeah. And my team is so great. You know, we're very collaborative. So I'm trying to think we have, for example, um, oh my gosh, this is a magnum. So I'm being very strong. <laughs> but so, you know, for example, um, this is for the 25th annual Screen Actors Guild Awards. And so for those of you who can't see, it's, you know, the statuette on black paper covered with like uh, gold confetti for the celebration. And right. it's really statue forward. But oh, for this year, we also had to integrate the 25th anniversary logo. So it was, oh, wow. it was even more. Um, and because you know our team is so collaborative, each designer often uh, submits a concept for a wine label, and there's five designers on, in the studio. So we're showing not only one version of the perfect balance of all those, we're showing five versions and then iterations after that. And so it's always just such a fun challenge to design for something that has such interesting constraints. Um, and I just, oh, oh my God, yeah, the idea no. of someone holding up their wine bottle like it's an Oscar, like you just blew my mind. Yeah. I know, right? It's wonderful. And it, well done uh, on that design. That's beautiful. You've managed okay. all the elements really well. It's Thank beautiful uh, result there. But yet to your point about, you know, designers doing different variations, you know, I, throughout my career, I've worked with wonderful designers and I always remember a few of my colleagues, we'd always say the design like tells you, like it, it will let you know, like you'll see five or 25 variations on a label solution and it will, it will tell you, yeah. you will very clearly, the winner will very clearly reveal itself in, in the nuance and balance of those elements. And you can really only find that out by exploring those. So that's why designers often will do multiple versions, which can be challenging because now you've got to whittle down to one or two, but it's that exploration that is important Yeah, for and the so designer. I always think, I think it was Herb Lublin who was like, if you want, if you want my idea, I'm going to show you one concept. He would do one logo for a client. You know, here IBM have logo. <laughs> I've heard of designers that do yeah. that. And as much as I like that, that bravado, I think that exploratory process is so important to us and the iterative process. And, and yeah. also, you know, I think about, you know, when you think about wine, you're not just designing for the end consumer. You're also designing for all the different stakeholders, whether it's the producer or the yes. winemaker, whether it is, you know, a, a persona like, Francis Ford Coppola, whether it is the marketing team who has very specific goals. So there's so many different ways that you need, you have many masters or many stakeholders yes. for one okay. design and, and having to kind of weave the, the narrative and, and the goals of all of those different people um, in one is just so, so fun and so challenging. And then you think from the consumer side, like you have people who are looking at the internet, you have people who are holding it in their hand, you have people who are at a tasting room. So it's just, you know, I, I think you know, when I started Vint and, and, you know, Vint is now almost two years old, um, despite all of our experience at Cooper's Talk, Vint as a brand is, is relatively new. And, you know, when I started, it was because of all the projects we work on in our studio uh, for the last 20 years, it was the wine label projects that were the most challenging and yes. most rewarding 
and, you know, yeah. have so much creative freedom. So the fact that you've spent 26 years designing yeah. online packaging, you have you have every designer's dream job. Oh, <laughs> like, truly, like, so much so that I created a whole new division of my company to do more of it. So I just, I, I just think you're so, you're so lucky and it's so you've earned it. You've done such an amazing job um, yeah. moving this industry forward and, and being such a great, um, you know, torchbearer for all, all wine packaging designers out there. Oh, thank you. That's a tremendous compliment. Thank you. Yeah. I like back to my point about the passion, just the passion for the industry is there. And it's in every project that I work on and I design because I love it. I find myself naturally, a smile is on my face while I'm designing wine labels and I'm not even consciously aware of it because I love it that much. And to back to your point of how to kind of, you know, satiate, check all the boxes, right. And please all the stakeholders, um, definitely take into consider everything that needs to be done and needs to be achieved. And then just focus on the design being strong and working well. And I think that's where we rely on our expertise as designers, what that looks like and what that is. And so as long as you rely on those, that toolbox that you have and those skills that you have, the design, you know, is the design result is successful and, and does tend to satisfy all the stakeholders and check all the boxes. So, so it's nice, be true to your design process and, um, rely on your expertise. And of course, you know, feedback is wonderful and it, it's, it is very helpful to get fresh eyes to look at it and to consider, you know, the side of the various teams and to take that into consideration. And then if you, you know, fold that in, in a way that still preserves the, the elegance of your design and that will get you your most successful result. That's such great advice. And I think, you know, beyond just speaking to designers, you know, speaking to producers, especially smaller producers who are working with, you know, as much as I don't recommend this, <laughs> a friend or, you know, my sister knows Photoshop. Uh, at, if, if you can't afford to invest in a professional design team, you know, I just talked to a winery in Texas and they're like, we're producing like 8,000 bottles total. Okay. And I'm like, yeah, like you can't spend $10,000 in a wine label when you're only making 8,000 wines, you know? So if, if you aren't necessarily producing enough wine to invest in working with a professional, really, you know, harken back into what Nicole just said and think about all of the ways that you can and take that advice as you reflect on the concepts that are presented to you, whether it's by a huge studio or an in-house designer or a freelancer or your friend, you know, there's just opportunities to take this into how you reflect and, and what kind of client you are in terms of working with a designer. Um, and being educated, being an educated client, knowing that there's so much that goes into it beyond your gut instinct are beyond yes. what you like, you know, totally. that, that your designer has a strategy um, to move the, and elevate the label beyond just your personal preference. Um, so I love that you were able to illustrate how your designs have come to life and even taking Francis's original inspiration and filtering it through that design lens and making sure that it, it's, it's still honoring, you know, that inspiration, yeah. that, that enhanced storytelling. It's so critical. Always, definitely. Yeah, and for the new, you know, small winery, um, what they could do if they're working with a single designer or maybe two designers is go to the store, you know, go consider that your art gallery, go take a look. What do you feel works? What doesn't work? What do you want to avoid or stay away from? What works really well? What uh, reflects a similar style? And let that inspire you. Def definitely not take a design. You're not stealing or taking anything, but you can certainly always, we are all always constantly inspired by everything. I'm inspired by fashion, architecture, nature, yeah. I, I'm it, innovation in any form. I'm, I'm not just inspired by package design, but, um, you know, let that be a nice starting point for maybe beginning designers or wineries that don't have the budget to reach for a nice agency or a, a experienced designers. Yeah. And don't be afraid to stand out you do, right. you, yeah. you know, something Amanda said in one of our recent episodes was it's not about getting 5% of all possible customers. It's about getting 100% of your dream customer. And That's when right. you, yeah. when you are able to really define who you're targeting, what your brand is, how you connect with them emotionally, what idea they're buying into and relate all of that in your packaging, you can truly do whatever you want. There are no rules in wine design. I mean, there's, there's cola, yeah. <laughs> TTV, oh, but, which is the back label. That's at the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, like, there, but there, there are no, there are no real rules when it comes to fitting in or standing out or following in. Just be true to yourself and make sure that you're, you're, you're not chasing those trends or chasing the conventions. You know, absolutely. I amen to that, Scout. Julie, I think that is the rule: is be authentic to the story. You know, if, if you're a small winery and 
you have a story of your family and the heritage, by all means, let that lead the design concept, you know, share that with your designer and um, anything you can get, any information, any, any material like that or content really will inspire your designer. So just be as authentic to yourself as you can. And that naturally differentiates, right? Because there's no other winery like you and there's no other place with the same story as you. So, so if you can really focus on that, then that's great tips for success. Yeah. And 98% of millennials crave authentic brands. I would think so. I would think so. I, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, in surveys, survey says, uh, 90 and I would hope so. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. They prefer authentic and authenticity in, in their products and their brands. And you see that in beauty products. You see that in fashion. You see that in like all the brands that people are engaging with. So, so critical. All right. I feel like we could talk forever and I don't want to, <laughs> I want to bend people's ear for too long. Um, but I always try to wrap up these episodes with kind of the hardest question because we, you've given so much great advice already. Um, but what is, what is your number one advice? And you're welcome to revisit something we've already talked about, but what is your number one advice for moving wine, for increasing sales, for, for even moving the industry as a whole? Like what, what design advice do you have for, for helping wineries move wine? Right. I think just, um, you know, being distinctive and being, um, unique, you know, it, I think it's most important that you know who you are first, yeah. right? If you don't know who you are, then how can you represent yourself? So, so that's that take that deep dive as a winery for, of your own story and, and really distill that down to what are the core themes, values, style of your winery, and then let that inspire your packaging and, and how it's packaged. You know, like maybe it's a bottle with no capsule. Maybe it's a bottle with just a cork. If that's the style of that winery, then follow that. You yes. know, path. And if it's something different, then follow that path. So, so don't feel that you need to do what everyone else is doing. Don't ever feel that. Feel that you you want to do what's most relevant to your style. So the better you know that, yeah. the better it will be. And I think that's the success of like a lot of the you know, Coppola projects is it it there's never been a doubt about who or what that is. It was always very, and is, continues to be very clearly communicated. So that's, that's, the, that's the winning ticket right there it, is if you have that clarity, then it's easy. So that, that's what I would challenge the new winery to discover and define is who they are and what their story is. And now articulate that to your designer and then let your designer just create and you'll have a beautiful result. Yes. I love that. And not to have a shameless plug, but like, that's what we do at Vint. <laughs> like we work with our clients to help them develop that brand compass for their brand and the brand story, the power statements, which are kind of like our, our quick, like quick hit taglines for clients that the message and, and that allows them to make all those choices with clarity. And so, you know, and even if a client has design already, we'll have them work with Amanda on the side. It's freelance. Um, so if you are ever looking for just like help you get to that story and you don't know, like you're having trouble making decisions and how am I unique and how am I distinctive, right. you know, email me at hello at vent.studio and I will connect you with our strategist, um, completely divorced from Vint as a studio. You can work with her independently. She just changes lives and it's like therapy for your company. So I can't not recommend Amanda Wurzbach enough. Um, oh, that's so great. You have that resource. That's wonderful. Uh, it's, you know, I, I'm, I've known Amanda for over a decade. And I, I honestly cannot think of one branding project we've done in studio in the last 10 years where we did not work with Amanda it, because it is just mission critical. So, so I, that's definitely my number one advice as well is find that, find that clarity about what makes you unique and different and yes. how to say that in a way that translates through your design, your messaging across the board, that big idea. Definitely. Yeah. And that will, you know, translate to every element of your package, whether it's an uncoated label stock with texture, maybe it's on craft paper, maybe you're not using any, you probably may would avoid gold foils or any metallics. You know, it depends on the style. If it's more rustic and um, natural, then you're going to let that influence the materials that you use too for your package. So yeah, every, from top of the bottle to the bottom, you, you yeah. want, the, um, you know, the theme to come through in the package. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Well, we've been talking to the amazing Nicole Walsh, who's the creative manager at Delicato Family Wines and the family Coppola. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so, so grateful for your time and your insights. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Oh, uh, yeah, LinkedIn, my LinkedIn uh, profile. Yeah, if you just type in Nicole Walsh Delicato, it, they'll pop up. Um, yeah, that's probably the best source. 
I love it. And, and of course, everyone check out the amazing work happening at Delicato. And of course, they recently yeah. acquired the family Coppola family of wines. Uh, if you'd like to see any of Nicole and her team's amazing work over the years, you can check out those two brands online. Uh, and thank you to them for sharing Nicole with me today. I know it's always exciting when we get to talk to someone in-house at a major winery and share those insights. So until next time, thank you for listening to Vinted and we'll see you all soon. Cheers. Thank you, Scout. Tune in for the next Vinted. Subscribe today. For future episodes, marketing advice, and more, follow me on Instagram at Scout Driscoll. Learn more about Vince Design and Branding Services for wineries at www.vint.studio.